What's up everybody? My name is Eric. Welcome to my channel, Eric the Tutor. What's up everybody? My name is Eric. Welcome to my channel, Eric the Tutor. Today, we're going to be introducing our new series on anatomy. And I'm going to be going each week and giving a breakdown of what I learned in anatomy that past week, okay? So today, we're starting week one. It's going to be a few videos for the series, and each week we're going to get new videos, all right? So let's go ahead and jump in. Today, we're going to start with the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. Let's get familiar with the spinal cord, okay? So we have to define the central nervous system that's made up of two things. What do you think it's made up of? It's going to be made up of the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, and the spinal cord is going to be the focus of our video today. All right, they also have the peripheral nervous system. Peripheral nervous system. That is going to be composed of the autonomic nervous system. And the somatic nervous system. Okay, and then the autonomic nervous system can be broken down further into the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. All right, so those are all videos we'll talk about much later, but today let's go ahead and focus on the spinal cord. So I'm going to draw the spinal cord for us. Okay, something like that. Now, you'll notice up here, we're going to say this is the occipital bone. All right, that means the spinal cord. So let's go ahead and denote that this is our spinal cord. Our spinal cord derives from the occipital bone and in occipital bone, we have the brain stem, okay? The brain stem. Now let's go ahead and show a few layers that we're going to learn about, okay? So the spinal cord, although it's very microscopic, you can't see it to the naked eye. It's thinly covered by a layer known as pia mater, okay? So that's the most deep to the body, right? So you have the spinal cord, and we're making our way, we're coming outwards, we hit the pia mater first. So this is covered by pia mater. All right, now we have to protect the spinal cord further, so we're gonna need multiple layers to protect our spinal cord. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw another layer here. Okay, this layer is called our arachnoid layer, arachnoid mater. Now the reason they call it arachnoid is because if you look at it in the lab, it actually looks like spider webs. It looks white and filmy and it's very web-like. It's quite interesting, all right? So that's gonna be our arachnoid mater. We have one more layer one more layer here this is going to be called our dura mater dura for tough in latin this is tough mother right it's a very thick layer on the outside to help protect our spinal cord all right now there's a couple other landmarks we're going to need to know all along, so as we, as we keep going out further, right, um, there's vertebrae on each side of our spinal cord. So I'll go ahead and just denote them as boxes for now. We can go ahead and jump into the anatomy of vertebrae much later. I'll go ahead and make another video on that. So just for now, I'll go ahead and show some vertebrae, just a rough schematic. Okay, now I want to talk specifically about these last two vertebrae here. Just like that, okay? So you'll notice 
it appears that the spinal cord starts to taper off at a particular location and we can use this as a landmark. This is L1 vertebrae and L2 vertebrae. Okay. Now that's going to be important because if we want to do something like remove cerebral spinal fluid to test for infection or a hematoma in the brain, we're going to need to have a landmark so we can inject the needle and take out the fluid without damaging any of any of the spinal cord. We don't want to cause any paralysis. All right. So other couple important areas. So the region outside of the dura, in between the vertebrae, right? So kind of in this region here. This is going to have a special name. Now we're talking about being outside or superficial to the dura mater. So we can call this epidural space. I'm sure you have heard of giving an epidural or spinal tap. Um, that's going to be the region where they actually inject that epidural to maybe numb the rest of the body. All right, so somewhere along that region. Again, they'll probably do it much, much more inferior to avoid accidentally going too far through these layers and damaging the spinal cord. But that region superficial to the dura is the epidural space. We we'll also have a region between the dura and the arachnoid space. So that would be deep to the dura and superficial, superficial to the arachnoid space. So that's this space in here in blue. This space we can go ahead and call the subdural space. Now this is an important area because you'll see there's not a lot of room in here. So this actually isn't uh, a particular space. It's called potential space. So this is important. This is potential. There's potential space in there. You can think of it as a deflated balloon and they're rubbing up against each other. There's, there's really no room there, but if you were to put air in there, you could definitely fill up that balloon. The reason that it's important is for pathology purposes. That space could end up being filled with fluid that shouldn't be there or an infection, uh, some sort. So that's going to be an important clinical aspect. All right. Now we're going to keep going deep. We have another layer I want to talk about. This is our area in here. All of this. This is going to be superficial to the pia, and it's going to be deep to the arachnoid. So we're going to call this our sub-arachnoid space. Okay, so that's all that area in orange. Another important aspect is this fluid that's floating around in here. It's quite a bit of fluid. It's going to be something known as CSF. That's cerebral spinal fluid. That's important because it basically bathes the spinal cord and, and the other nerves that are going to be coming off of the spinal cord. Um, there's also cerebral spinal fluid in the brain. This is directly connected all the way upwards to the brain stem and further into the brain. So if there was a bleed of some sort in the brain, we can actually have fluid drip down and fall into this region down here. This region down here is actually very important as well. So like I said, there's cerebral spinal fluid. So all down here, there's a lot of cerebral spinal fluid, about 150 milliliters of cerebral spinal fluid. And you'll see that it's kind of encased, right? It's not going anywhere. We can call this region the lumbar cistern. Lumbar cistern cistern being something that can hold a body of water. Lumbar referring to the region of the lumbar region. So lumbar cistern being an area to hold cerebral spinal fluid. So there's going to be lots of cerebral spinal fluid floating around there. Another important drawing I want to have here. So 
like I said, the spinal cord begins to taper off between L1 and L2 vertebrae. But we have nerve fibers that go much lower than L1 and, and L2. So the spinal cord doesn't technically end here. It just begins to taper off and it becomes a new, a new landmark. So there's actually these hair-like structures that begin to come off the tip of this spinal cord here. And they kind of float around like this. They call this region the cauda equina. Cauda equina means a horse's tail. So early anatomists saw this and they thought that it looked like a horse's tail. So they call it a horse's tail. All right, so those are those floating nerve fibers, right? So they begin to stem off of the tip of the spinal cord. The tip of the spinal cord has a fancy name. It's called the conus medullaris. All right, conus meaning tip, right? It's kind of, you can see the shape of the spinal cord starts to form a, a point. That's very important, so if we're examining the spinal cord in anatomy lab, we can actually find that landmark and we can find the spinal curve, the spinal nerves that come off of there because we know it's between L1 and L2. So that helps us orient ourselves. It also, it also lets us know where the beginning of the lumbar cistern is. So if we needed to remove cerebral spinal fluid to test for meningitis or to test for a brain bleed, if perhaps the CT scan didn't catch it, about 80% of the CT scans can catch blood um, bleeds in the brain. But the other 20%, we can actually do uh, a lumbar puncture. So if we, if we wanted to inject cerebral spinal fluid, that's going to be called lumbar puncture. That's different from giving an epidural, where we're actually injecting anesthesia and we're hoping to penetrate somewhere in that region in the epidural space. Okay, so if we did a lumbar puncture, notice we're gonna be going in the lumbar cistern. Now it looks like we could damage maybe one of those nerve fibers, but it's highly unlikely that we do that because think of these as floating around in water, right? Um, if there were just floating pieces in water, it's, it's really hard to actually puncture that if it's, it'll, they'll just move out of the way once the needle goes in there. So that's a, an important reason why we do the lumbar puncture there, okay? Another important landmark coming off of the tip of the conus medullaris is something known as the phylum terminale. I'll go ahead and do that one in, let's do that one in blue. Now I'm running out of space down here, but this will go much further. So let's go ahead and denote this as the phylum terminale. Phylum being piece of fiber. Terminale meaning it's the last thing that's gonna be coming off of the spinal cord. It's gonna go much lower. It's gonna actually attach to the coccyx. Okay, we'll get to that anatomy much later, but it's going to attach to the coccyx, which is very, very low. It's actually below the lumbar, below the sacral region, and it attaches to the coccyx, which is the last bone at the very tip, which used to be um, remnants of a tail. So it attaches there. <clears throat> now you notice, if this phylum terminale is gonna go way, 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 way down here and attach to the coccyx, then we're gonna need to eventually leave this, this dura mater space. So actually this phylum terminale will pierce through the dura mater say this is the coccyx down here again it's going to be much more inferior but it's going to pierce through that dura mater and when it does that it's going to attach on to that bone and it's pretty much going to be acting as a ligament that's stabilizing the spinal cord so some pathology there is if in early development if it actually is pulled too far down if it's too tight or uh, maybe it's too short, it's, it's really attached down there in the coccyx, that phylum terminale can tug and pull on our spinal cord. And if it does that, 
the spinal cord is going to pull on the brain stem and the brain stem is going to be pulling on different parts of the brain and that's going to cause a lot of neurological deficits so very very serious condition and um, a lot of times uh, surgical procedures would be to actually snip that phylum that phylum terminale and remember the phylum terminale is just fiber so not nerve there's no nerve endings in the phylum terminale there are nerve endings in the cotyl quina but it's important to note that you can snip that phylum terminale and things would be all right Another question I had when I was taking this is, well, if you if you snip that phylum terminale, won't this spinal cord just like go flying off? Actually not. This phylum terminale is more evolutionary. It used to be remnants of the tail, but but now it, it actually doesn't have that many functions and in fact can actually cause more problems than anything. Sometimes um, a patient might come in and they're, they're having a lot of pain neurosurgeon might actually go in and snip that phylum terminale and next thing you know their pain is gone. So it's a very interesting aspect and it's very uh, apparent when you look at an anatomy lab you can actually trace that phylum terminale all the way down and you can see it go attached to the coccyx and then you can trace that phylum, termina phylum terminale all the way back to the conus medullaris. So again this is just all to help us orient ourselves when we're looking at the spinal cord to figure out where we are in case we need to do a lumbar puncture or anything of that sort, all right? So we covered the lumbar cistern, the phylum terminale. Remember, this is the coccyx down here. It's attached via a coccygeal ligament. Coccygeal ligament. That ligament is going to be made up of dura and pia mater. So remember, if this phylum terminale is coming off of our spinal cord, it's going to be made up of pia but it's gonna pierce through both the, the, sub, the arachnoid mater and the dura mater, but we're only gonna actually see the pia and the dura. So we're gonna see remnants of the pia, and then it makes sense that the dura is gonna be out there kind of encasing that pia mater, all right? So that ligament there, the coccygeal ligament's gonna be kind of made up of, of pia and dura mater. All right, so we talked about the different spaces. That's the, the anatomy of the spinal cord. Now there's gonna be much more anatomy in the next videos when we talk about vertebrae. We're gonna be talking about spinal nerves coming off of the spinal cord, um, right? We'll go into a lot of detail about that. But for now, that's the key takeaways here. This was probably two, three days worth of lecture material. Um, this was also our entire first lab in anatomy. Uh, of, an important portion, portion was just examining the spinal cord and, and trying to examine what's coming off of it, try to find landmarks. Okay, I think that's everything, guys. So thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.